So, um, well, Tuesday, we get to celebrate, not Halloween, but the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Um, and for that, I praise God. Uh, and this alone is a, a thing to thank God for, because if it wasn't for the Reformation, we wouldn't be here today. Um, we wouldn't have a copy of the Bible that we could actually read. Um, so, although my students have no idea what the Reformation is, don't have no idea who Martin Luther is, they think it's Martin Luther King Jr. Anytime I mention him, Martin Luther, they're like, you mean Martin Luther King Jr.? No, Martin Luther. Um, so, um, which they don't even understand that the fact that they're in a public school is a um, part of the fringe benefits of a of the Reformation. So praise be to God uh, that you know, he when he said that that the gates of hell would not prevail against his gospel or against his church. He was true. Uh, so uh, praise be to God for that. So. So, uh, let us open in prayer, and then uh, we will uh, get into the Word. Father, uh, we do come before you uh, right now thanking you uh, for your goodness, thanking you for your kindness, and that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. That, uh, Lord, we are, we are not left without hope. Uh, in fact, you've given us the greatest of hopes. You've given us uh, the promise of eternal, of eternal life through Christ Jesus. So we come and we ask that as we uh, get into uh, the text of Scripture tonight, uh, God, you would speak by your Spirit um, and through your Word, and that you would transform us uh, by the renewing of our minds, and that we would love you all the more uh, today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, next two weeks, we are actually going to be wrestling with uh, the text of Psalm 19. Sorry about that. Um, the reason uh, for the two-week stu study versus saying, okay, let's wrestle with all 14 verses tonight. One, um, I've already written a lot of pages on the first six verses. So if we went into 14, we'd be here till Tuesday. Um, that's one thing. But um, the reason actually for the two-week study uh, versus covering in one fell swoop is that this particular psalm has two, if not three, parts that you can see uh, in the text. You have verses 1 through 6, 7 through uh, 11, and then 12 through 14. But in particular, 1 through 6 and then 7 through 11 uh, deal... Um, those parts, they attest to the two witnesses that God has given to affirm his existence and call mankind to worship him and him alone. Um, we see that in verses 1 through 6 is God's work of creation. And in verses uh, 7 through 11, we see um, the other uh, witness to God's existence is his word, the Bible. Uh, it is these two witnesses that cry out against the sinner and demand that the sinner uh, seek the one whom they have spurned. So that these are, uh, this, what, you've been, what we've been given in this psalm is one half is general revelation, the other deals with special revelation. Um, that it is these two witnesses, they cry out against the sinner. They say, sinner, worship God. Worship God for he is worth it. Uh, in this psalm, he, David, he depicts the Lord God as author of both his world and word in a unified hymn. That the God of the Bible is also, also the God of creation. That there is no division in that. Um, all too often we see, and especially in our day, which is really nothing new. Um, I was reading today about some comments uh, made by Luther and Calvin uh, dealing with creation. And some of the comments they make, I go, it's really not changed in 500 years. 
Uh, and I know I had that same uh, thought when I had read, when I was reading uh, part of Calvin's Institutes, and something that Calvin had described was very similar to Darwinian evolution, the way that it was described, which is really nothing but a rehashing of something the Greeks taught. So that all being said is that in, in our day, there's the you know, people, well, you can believe the Bible, but then there's science. When in reality, the God of the Bible is the God of science, that all truth is God's truth. And so when we're looking to creation and we're looking to discover how it, how it functions, how it works, that it teaches us something about God. Uh, it, it teaches us uh, parts of his characteristics and uh, parts of his character uh, that we get a taste of that we have to wait until we see the scriptures to fully reveal that. Um, but the, the human race, uh, we see this, that in this unified hymn, God has revealed himself to mankind through these two avenues, through creation, through the word. And the human race stands accountable to him because of his nonverbal creation and his verbal, the Bible, communications. Um, this week, we will consider how God reveals himself in his work of creation and how no one is left with an excuse of not knowing whether or not God exists and whether or not they're accountable to him. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is, if you haven't already, uh, turn to Psalm 19, and we'll read the, the text in its entirety, um, but we're only going to cover the first six verses because we want to get the, the weight of this psalm. Psalm 19 for the choir director, uh, a psalm of David. Uh, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances uh, to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, a which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. Uh, they are more desirable than gold, yes, mu than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Uh, moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me, and I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. Father, um, if I'm being quite honest with you right now, before your people, I'm wholly inadequate for this task. Um, I feel it even now that, that I, don't, I don't deserve to speak of this. So that God, if it, if it wasn't for your spirit, God, I would, I would stand under the condemnation of this text. I would stand, uh, that the universe would stand against me as a witness testifying to my own um, wickedness. So what I ask uh, for me, um, even Lord, I'm selfishly asking that you would help me. That you would help me to declare your word and only your word that I would, Lord, I am nothing but a slave. Uh, a mere spokesperson, a mouthpiece. And I would ask that you would glorify yourself through that. Not for your people. I ask that, Lord, you would 
uh, comfort them with your word, that you would strengthen them with your word, that you would embolden them with your word uh, to speak out against the falsehoods of this age, to proclaim uh, that you reign above all the earth, over all the universe. For there is no other God but you. Um, you alone are creator. Lord, you've made everything by your hands or through uh, the power of your word. Uh, the things that exist exist because you have told them to exist. And the reason why they hold together is because your son continues to hold them together. And Father, the foolishness and outright rebellion of man is that we can look and see something that is so obvious and yet we make up things to suit our fancies so that we can plug our ears and cover our eyes and ignore our Creator. So Lord, speak uh, today uh, amongst your people here and even those who may be... Um, online. And Lord, even after uh, the recording goes up, I ask that you would speak even then, that your word would be faithful, that it would not return to you void. It would, it would go out and accomplish that which you've set it out to accomplish. Uh, for those whom you wish to harden, may they be hardened. For those whom you wish to soften, may they be softened. And may you be praised in all of this. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Pardon me. So, um, in the first verse that we see, uh, this was actually, as, as a side note, um, this, this psalm has a very special place for me. Um, when I was in high school, uh, what's funny is my, our high school had a, a newspaper. And every year, the last newspaper of the year would have these predictions for the outgoing seniors. Mine, that I, I didn't know anybody on the newspaper, but apparently uh, the prediction uh, that for me was that I was going to go to Washington, D.C. to protest evolution. So uh, my actual term paper uh, that year was on the validity of creationism and uh, really the stupidity of evolutionary theory. Uh, it wasn't at all biased. Um, so, but this actually it was this psalm, um, they kind of played very heavy, especially these first six verses played very heavy into that paper. Um, because it tells us here in the first verse that the heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse. Uh, it's declaring the work of his hands, or I believe the New King James will uh, say that the firmament uh, is, t is declaring uh, his handiwork. What is described here is not some one-time occurrence. So the, the heavens are telling. Their expanse is declaring. This is not some one-time occurrence that happened a, a long time ago. This wasn't um, something that there was this one point in time that creation declared the glory of God, that it told of his handiwork, it told of the skill that is wrought by his hands. This isn't a one-time occurrence. Rather, what David is saying here, and what David says here is that the heavens and their expanse are perpetually declaring and proclaiming God's glory. He, it's telling, it's ongoing, it keeps telling keeps proclaiming, it keeps declaring God's glory. The only refrain that creation has learned is that God is glorious. It knows no other song. It knows no other tune. It knows no other melody. Creation can't help but do this every day, every moment, with every uh, burst of sunlight, you know, as the sun begins to do what it does, as the stars are up in the sky, that it does nothing but declare the glory of God. 
Elsewhere in the Psalms it is written, Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens, and the waters that are above the heavens. Psalm 148, 3-4 tells us that. It is so ingrained in creation that the song that it sings is set on repeat. It's like a broken record. It's going, God is glorious. God is glorious. God is glorious. God is glorious. It does nothing but declare his glory. In fact, the heavens and their expanse can do nothing but tell of God's glory and declare the greatness of God's, of this very same God's skill. Spurgeon notes this, that it is not merely glory, it's not just glory that the heavens declare, but it's the glory of God. For they deliver to us such unanswerable arguments for a conscious, intelligent, planning, controlling, and presiding creator that no unprejudiced person can remain unconvinced by them. The testimony given by the heavens is no mere hint, but a plain declaration, and it is a declaration of the most constant and abiding kind. All the heavens and their expanse, uh, th- which contains the celestial bodies, the air, the light, the rain, dews, etc. Like everything that the heavens contains. So not just our sky, but outer space and further, further up and further in. And as you get further and further out, it's all containing that. That they all display the infinite power and wisdom of their almighty creator. It is impossible, uh, then, for us to actually ignore uh, the song that is sung because the heavens were created for this very purpose. That they, uh, the heavens and their expanse were created to draw mankind's attention heavenward and see how great and awesome the Lord is. The, everything that has been created, we ask the, uh, the, the kids, we're uh, going through the uh, catechism for boys and girls, um, thanks to Founders Ministries, uh, that they, the question is, who made you? Well, God made me. What else did he make? All things. Why then, why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. So as God has created the heavens and the earth, when we see that in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The reason he did that was not because he was lonely, not because he was like, golly gee, I just, I just wish there was somebody else here. God was completely satisfied within his own holy communion, or his own holy community, let me say that a little better, that in the Godhead, there was perfection. There was no loneliness. God didn't need it, need anything else but himself. He is his own holy pleasure. But in God created to glorify himself. And because we have, everything has been created for the glory of God, creation can't do anything but do what it was made for. Which is quite amazing when you think about it, that uh, light came into existence because God told it to exist. You know, the thing that was not became because God said, let there be light. And light said, okay, even though it didn't exist. It's like when Jesus told Lazarus to come forth. Lazarus was dead, but he had to obey. That light obeyed. That everything that we see in the creation account of Genesis 1 and uh, kind of expanded in Genesis 2, it all happens because God wanted it to happen. He commanded it to happen. And it obeyed. Everything in creation obeys the command of God except us. That the sun does what the sun does because God told it to. And it doesn't have a problem with it. The stars do what the stars do because that's what God told them to do. That the waves and the winds and everything does what God has told it to do. But then when it comes to us, we go, no, I don't care. And how stupid are we to do that? And... The thing for us to remember is that although, God, although man ignores the melody of creation, the heavens are still declare, telling and declaring the glory of God without ambiguity. 
We may ignore them, but they're still singing. And they're going to keep singing. While the language of verse 1 would certainly be enough to settle the question as to uh, what level of consistent declaration exists, nonetheless, David is not satisfied to leave any room for doubt. Verse 2, David writes, day to day uh, pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. See, day in and day out, creation is shouting its maker's praise. And it is this day and night uh, proclamation that reminds us of the faithfulness of God. It is not only declaring that God is glorious, God is glorious, God is glorious, but as day comes in and it leaves, as night comes in and it leaves, it is declaring the faithfulness of God. In Genesis 8.22, it is written, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, in cold and heat, in summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So, you know, climate change? Nope. Because it won't. It won't change. Nothing, it will, everything will stay on course as the way that it has because God has said it will be that way so as to remind us of the faithfulness of God. As day breaks, God's faithfulness is declared. As night is ushered in, God's faithfulness is declared. As we see dusk right out through uh, the back door there, or the front door technically, um, God's faithfulness is being declared right now as we look to the skies. As the sun is seen coming up on the eastern horizon and setting in the western horizon, God's faithfulness is declared. As the moon goes through its waxing and waning, God's faithfulness is declared. As the stars fill the sky every night, God's faithfulness is declared. As the clouds move across the sky with their promises of rain, God's faithfulness is declared. As the heat of summer comes and goes, God's faithfulness is declared. As the chill of winter sets in and eventually departs, God, again, his faithfulness is declared. As it is written in Lamentations, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God has set day and night apart as objects to unceasingly declare his faithfulness and his praise. So as the sun is rising, God is going He's declaring his glory. He's declaring his faithfulness through a promise that he made in Genesis 8. As it sets and we see the moon come up and we see the beauty of that just giant ball of dust that is there. God is declaring his faithfulness. As winter sets in and it's, you know, in the brutality of it, God's faithfulness is declared. As summer comes in, God's faithfulness is declared. There's, as we see springtime, as we see harvest, all of that is there is a constant reminder of the faithfulness of God. And yet we ignore it. Yet we as people, yes, as mankind, we want nothing to do with that. You get people, oh, I don't know if God exists. I just wish you'd give me a sign. Are you breathing? There you have it. Can you see? Do you feel the warmth of the sun on your flesh? Do you see the sunrise? Do you see the sunset? Do you see the stars in the heavens? And if you really, you know, if you're in Idaho, you really can see the stars in the heavens. And yet you're like, where's God? I don't know. As time passes, God is declared to be great, for he is great. And it is his greatness, his faithfulness, and his praise that the heavens and their expanse and day and night all declare. But what is interesting is what verse 3 tells us. It says that there is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. The depths of creation's declarations are all done without words. There is no human tongue that is used by creation to proclaim the glory of God. 
Rather, creation's very existence and function is a language so clear that anyone can understand it without the aid of a translator. We don't need to have somebody come and go, can you explain that to me? No, innately we get it. We innately get the glory of God when we look to the sun and we go, man, you know, you see the sunrise and go, that's just gorgeous. If everything was created by random chance, then it's not gorgeous. It, is, it doesn't have innate beauty. But we look at it and say, this has innate beauty. Why? Because the one who is beauty created it. When we look and we see uh, the, the majesty of the heavens and feel so tiny at how large that it is, how much greater then is the God who holds it all in place? And this is why, you know, the question is, are, there pe are people lost who have never heard of Jesus? Yes, there are. It's not because they haven't re responded to the gospel. It's because they've worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. That they've looked at all of creation and gone, let me go cut down this tree and I'm going to make an idol and worship the thing that I made with my hands. And while I'm at it, I'm going to go make a pot roast with the same tree I cut down to make an idol. It's stupid. It's just absolutely stupid. The, again, this is, it needs no translator. Calvin writes this, uh, the difference in variety of languages does not prevent the preaching of the heavens and their language from being heard and understood in every quarter of the world. The differences of languages, of languages is a barrier which prevents different nations from maintaining mutual intercourse. And it makes him who is in his own country uh, who in his own country is distinguished for his eloquence. When he comes into a foreign country, he's either dumb or if he attempt to speak, barbarous. And even although a man uh, could speak all languages, he could not speak to a Grecian and a Roman at the same time. For as soon as he began to direct his discourse to the one, the other would cease to understand him. David, therefore, by making a tacit uh, comparison, enhances the efficacy of the testimony which uh, the heavens bear to their creator. The import of his language is, different nations differ from each other as to language, but the heavens have a common language to teach all men without distinction. Nor is there anything but their own carelessness to hinder even those who are most strange to each other and who live in the most distant parts of the world from profiting, as it were, at the mouth of the same teacher. A lot of things to say. There is no excuse for, you know, we, we always throw, what about the person in the jungles of South America, in the Amazon, or... What about, you know, those random people that nobody's ever met on the African plain? They are equally guilty. They are equally con condemned. They will equally have their place in the lake of fire. Not because they have spurned the gospel, but because they have worshipped the creature. That they have worshipped the stars, they've worshipped the heavens, they've worshipped the sun. They've done all of these things rather than worshipping the God who has cared for them. And what is quite amazing when you think about it, that when God's judgment on the world uh, it, at the Tower of Babel was to separate their languages so that they couldn't work together anymore, but yet God has always left himself with a testimony, with a witness that speaks to all people at the same time in the same language. See, creation speech is so clear that the only thing that can obfuscate uh, what, is, what it is saying is the willful rebellion of the sinner who hates God so much that he or she refuses to pay heed to creation's testimony. Again, people always say, oh, whoa, is there a God? Yes, and you know it. You know God exists. And this is why it's important that when we go and we begin to preach the gospel to people, we don't sit there and play around with, in, in their realm. We say, no, you know God exists. Creation tells you it exists. Your conscience tells you he exists. 
You have no excuse. You have just plugged your ears and closed your eyes to reality. Now, albeit no human tongue is used, the message of the heavens is clear uh, for the entire world to hear. And here's the message. The creation did not come about by some random, unguided set of senseless circumstances. Rather, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Psalm 33, 6. The sinner has no excuse and cannot claim that they have never known that God exists. They can't claim it. So when the day of judgment comes, they go, God, I didn't know you exist. They're not going to be able to say that. They're going to go, you're right. I knew it. I knew it. Your creation told me. I just didn't want to hear it. They can't claim they've never known because the heaven's line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. No matter where any person is throughout this planet, there is no excuse. Why do you think that that you can't go a place where there isn't religion of some sort? We know We know, but we don't want to know the true God. We hate him. There's no question that God exists. In fact, it is so obvious, so blatant, and so clear that the heavens declare God's glory that that Psalm 14, 1 says this, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And this concept of being a fool, this doesn't mean that they're stupid. But the biblical concept of being a fool is one in which the fool is someone who imbibes in his or her sin and does what he or she can to block out any recognition of God's sovereignty over his or her life by saying there is no God. That they repeat this mantra to themselves, there is no God, there is no God, there is no God, there is no God, because they want their sin so badly and they've got to speak to themselves so loudly to drown out what creation is telling them, what, to what their conscience is crying out against them. This is exemplified continuing in Psalm 14.1 when David continues and says, they are corrupt, they've committed abominable deeds, there is no one who does good. This verse from Psalm 19, our our text today, makes it so clear that mankind is without excuse that the Apostle Paul Paul even quotes this in Romans 10, 18. He says, but I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice has gone out through into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. People know. Oh, they know. They just don't want to. They they just don't want to know. They want to do everything they can to block out what is crying out against them. So they make up things. They make up their own gods. They make up things in their own image to suit their own fancies, to to titillate their own uh, desires. But when the day of judgment comes... Creation and their conscience will be held up against them and say, here you have it. It's been here the whole time. David sets forth the sun uh, in verses 4 through 6 as an example of the heaven's witness of uh, God's uh, glory. The first thing that David speaks of concerning the sun is its temporariness uh, when he writes of how in the heavens God has placed a tent for the sun. A tent is not a place of permanent abode. This isn't a mansion. This isn't a a house. It's a tent. It's not a place of permanent abode, but it is a place that is intended to one day be taken down. In Revelation 21, the Apostle John writes of the new heaven and new earth and how in the new Jerusalem, or how uh, the new Jerusalem has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb, that Christ himself will be the light of the new heavens and new earth. That the sun itself, it even recognizes the fact that it is in a tent, that it sits there where it is, 
is a declaration of the coming of the Son of Man in power and might and glory who will wipe everything clean and then himself will be the light. If the Son resides in a temporal estate, then the one who placed it there must be eternal. That it's it's necessary that if the thing that is impermanent be placed there by something that is permanent, by one who is eternal. Furthermore, David speaks of the son's magnific- uh, magnificence as that of a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. That here he is, he is ready to go for that wedding. He's, he's about to get his woman. He's, there's glory to him. There is a certain pomp and circumstance to the sun that surpasses anything on the earth. And especially now with all the technology that we see and we can get these, these pictures of the sun and go, that's power. That is glory. You know, as you see those bursts coming off of the sun, the solar flares, and you go, oh, I'm glad it's 93 million miles away. You know, that we see that that there is nothing on earth that can compare with the splendor and majesty of the sun. It is so great, the majesty of the sun is so great that nothing can look directly to the sun without there being damaging consequences. I mean, we can't even have the moon cover it and look at it and not have our eyes scorched. If the sun is so glorious, then how much more glorious is the one who made it? If the lamb who is going to be the light of the new Jerusalem is going to cast the sun out of its place and go, I ain't got any need for you, I got my own glory. If the sun pales in comparison to the one who made it, how glorious is the one who made it? How much more dazzling the glory must be of the God who merely spoke light into existence and confined that light to the sun. That he spoke it and light had to happen. It couldn't not happen because God said, let there be light. It was a command given to something that didn't even exist and it had to come into existence. How glorious must he be if this creation that pales in comparison to him, how great must he be? Thirdly, David also speaks of how the son rejoices as a strong man to run his course. That, you know, you, uh, if you ever had those athletes that there's, they have a course set before them, they have a, a, a task set before them, and then they're just like, I got this. I can do this. The sun has been given a course to run, and by it we are able to tell time. We see that in Genesis 1, 14 through 18. It is the sun's cheerful and faithful running of its course that tells us of the orderliness of the God who created it. And if the sun is happy to do what it was created to do, then how much more pleased is God who made the sun when the sun functions as he created it to? If the sun is happy and it's just a giant ball of gas with no soul, no feeling, nothing. But the Bible talks of it, it being rejoicing as a strong man. How much more pleasure does God have in seeing the things work out the way that he wanted them to? Although marred by sin. Now finally, David tells us there is nothing hidden from its heat. The sun, again, is 93 million miles away from our planet. And yet, if we stay outside too long in an unprotected manner, we run the risk of sunburns, skin cancer, dehydration, you name it. You leave something up in, you know, on the dashboard of your car too long, it gets sun bleached. Don't do that with your Bible. Um, that, you know, we, we do that and stuff gets destroyed by something that's 93 million miles away. Now, if something so far away that is nothing more than a giant ball of gas is able to harm us so harshly, 
then how much more frightening must be the imminent, omnipresent God who is a consuming fire? If the sun is that bad, how much more fierce is the anger of God? Again, and here's another thing to think about, that if we, we have to wear sunscreen, we have to wear long sleeve shirts and pants and hats and all these things to protect us from the fury that is the sun, which is so far away. We're not going to be able to stand before a holy God who is a consuming fire without something to cover us. And the only thing that we can have is the covering of Christ. I mean, we see it that when Moses says, God, show me your glory, he goes, you don't want to do that. I'll kill you. You will die just by the mere, my mere presence, my glory, which is his weight. I'll crush you. If we couldn't even get one, in, if we got any closer to the sun, we'd incinerate. How dare we think then that we can walk into the presence of a holy God without something to cover our sin? Again, sinners have no excuse for their willful ignorance of God's existence. It's a willful ignorance. Uh, Spurgeon said it, said it something this way, and I thought, man, so good. That he said, to the extent that if you can look to the heavens and look to the firmament and come away and say... Well, God doesn't exist. He said that to ignore this testimony is to be an idiot or a liar. So you're either stupid, you're an idiot, or you're a liar. Those are your options. Because the reality is this, is this is true. That you look to this, this declares God. So what camp do you fall in? See, it is a willful ignorance. We intentionally bar ourselves from thinking of God. Creation, moment by moment, hour by hour, day by day, night by night, year by year, stands forth as a witness for God and a witness against sinners. As time com comes and goes, as sinners die off, or they're born and they die, the creation stands there always giving an account, always giving a witness, always giving a testimony that God is God. The heavens and their expanse exist to call our attention to our creator. See, we should be like David in Psalm 8, 3 through 4, where, where he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You, we should be going, God, I... You care for all of this. You know every one of these stars by name, and yet you take care of me? That you give me breath every day, that, and I fail to praise you? That even I use my breath to curse you? That you give me a beating heart? You give me food? You give me clothing? God, who, what is man that you care for him? And yet, yet, we fall under the condemnation of Romans 1, 18 through 23. This is why people go to hell who have never heard of Jesus. It says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. They knew him. People know who God, they know God exists, but they didn't honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened, professing to be wise. I mean, how many people? We are, we've got science on our side. You know, We've got all of these things. I mean, when I was first being interviewed for Jerome Middle School, I was interviewed for a, a science position. And I was, you know, they looked at my resume. And of course, you know, 
no teaching experience. My, my degree is in biblical studies, and I have been a youth pastor. And they're like, well, what are you going to do with evolution? It's the backbone of biology. And I'm like, well, it's a farce. So they, will, they profess themselves to be wise. In doing so, they became fools. And again, fool doesn't mean that they're an idiot, that they're stupid. But what is the biblical concept of foolishness? Is to fall into sin and to love it so much that you do everything you can to ignore who God is. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. That they would rather... Uh, you have something uh, like Beelzebub, which is the lord of the flies. They would rather worship a fly than God. That they would rather look at something like uh, Artemis, one of the ugliest idols I've ever seen. They would rather worship that thing than the God who made them. See, men, women, and children are well aware of the existence of God and what he is like because creation reveals things about the creator. The trouble is not a lack of knowledge or testimonials of the creator. Rather, the trouble is mankind is sinful. Mankind hates God. That's the problem. It isn't that God has left himself without witness. He hasn't done it. In fact, his witness has gone out through all the earth, through all the ages. Wherever there have been people, there has been a testimony given. And where there haven't been people, the testimony is still there. I don't know if uh, you've seen this. It was something that, that Zach had sent me. Uh, this past week, Newsweek uh, released an article entitled, The Universe Should Not Actually Exist. CERN scientists discover, wow, thank you for stating the obvious. I've kind of known that since I read my Bible. The church has known it for 2,000 years. The people of God have known it for 6,000 because we're not millions of years old. In the article, there are statements like this. After performing the most precise experiments of, on antiprotons that have ever been carried out, researchers have discovered a symmetry in nature that they say just shouldn't be possible. Wow. You mean to tell me that a random unguided chance shouldn't create symmetry? Who would have thunk? One of the big questions about the universe is how the first matter formed after the Big Bang. Let there be light. That's how it formed. Because particles and antiparticles um, annihilate one another when they come in contact. Hmm. If there were exactly equal measures of both, the universe wouldn't exist. At least not in the form we see it today, which there's their casual, at least not in the way that we see it today. So, you know. As such, there must be an imbalance between particles and antiparticles, even if it is only by the tiniest fraction. But this is not the case. All experiments designed to find this asymmetry have come up blank. This is also true of the latest, which were recently carried out at a CERN um, by an international team of researchers. They're saying that particles and antiparticles, there should be one more than the other, because otherwise if there's perfect balance between the two, nothing exists. But yet, there's perfect balance between the two and everything exists. They say that the universe should not exist, and the thing is, it shouldn't exist. There's no reason why everything we have should exist by itself. This was something, again, that Luther ended up talking about, mentioning about Aristotle, that Aristotle believed in an eternal creation, or what we, you know, an eternal earth, an eternal universe, that basically sounds like this, you know, everything that you hear in high school biology of this continual fluctuation that 
and everything goes big, and then, oh, it's so big, and it slaps itself together and gets really tiny and then explodes again and just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We get that from Aristotle, who got it from the devil. But yet, and this is what I don't get. But again, this is a matter of this is what happens when you're darkened by your own foolishness. That they have a hard time believing in an eternal God. But they have to believe in an eternal universe. What? So eternity exists somehow. But we look at creation or what we know as creation and go and say, there was a point this didn't exist. There was a point when there was nothing. And then all of a sudden, it happened. And it's happened in such a way where there's perfect balance between things that should destroy each other. Huh. See, the universe, it, it should not exist, and instead of falling down and worshiping the God who created it, I mean, this, that should be enough. I you know, mean, Zach, we went back in this, this back and forth text battle over this article, because it was, we kind of were giggling um, over it, because it's like, <laughs> duh, the Bible's been saying this forever. But I'm, Zach, if you're watching, I'm going to steal what you said here. You know, he says this. Um, oh, let's see if I can pull it up. He goes, universe, I'm going to kill myself. Jesus, shut up and get back to work. You know, that the universe shouldn't exist as it is. Everything should destroy itself. That you look uh, everything at the atom and there's things that, that are happening that shouldn't be happening. And yet they happen. There's like this invisible force that sits in there. It's what I've heard it described as. You mean Jesus? Holding everything together? The universe, it should not exist, but it is holding together. Since the heavens declare God's glory, what is this telling us about God? Well, Colossians 1, we read this. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. Both in the heavens and, earth, and on earth, visible and invisible. So that kind of covers everything. Uh, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So why does the universe exist? Because Jesus wanted it to. It pleased him to do that. It says that he is before all things and in him... All things hold together. So the universe that should not exist exists because Jesus holds it together. And what's amazing is that this very same Jesus who holds thing, all, all these things together, that he one time came down in taking upon himself a human body. And not only did he take upon himself a human body, he didn't come as a fully grown man. He came as a zygote. He came in an embryonic state in in the womb of a woman, and yet, and through all of that, he was holding all things together. Do you wanna know why the universe looks like it shouldn't exist? It is because it shouldn't exist. And it could not exist by itself. That's why it looks that way. And if it were not for the Lord Jesus Christ creating and upholding all things, there would be nothing. It's just that simple. Sinners hate God so much that they will do everything in their powers to ignore what he has clearly revealed in creation about himself. In Job it is written, is not God in the height of heaven? Look also at the distant stars, how high they are. You say, what does God know? Can he judge through the thick, thick darkness? Clouds are a hiding place for him so that he cannot see and he walks on the vault of heaven. People think they can hide from God and will say things like this within their own hearts if not aloud. You know, if, if not out loud. However, just as there's no hiding from the heat of the sun, as verse 6 of tonight's passage tells us, there's no hiding from God. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. This is why the whole idea that you know, hell is the absence of the presence of God. No, it's not. It's frightening that you are still in the presence of God. God is very much there. 
God is the king of hell. God is the king of heaven. He is the one who rules and judges from his throne and condemns sinners and punishes sinners in hell, and you cannot escape him. He says, if I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Uh, that, that we have the future is as present to God as the past is. There is no escaping the ever-present one. God sees and knows each and everything that we do and will hold us accountable for it. The radius of the universe is 46.6 billion light years. So it's 93.2 billion light years in diameter. However, Solomon says this, Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot even contain the Lord. If the universe is that large, how much greater is God? For it is God who stretched out the heavens and made them. It is God who spoke the very thing that should not exist, the universe, into existence. And it will be God who will resurrect the sinner and cast them into the lake of fire for all eternity and keep them alive through the fury of his wrath. However, here's the trouble in all of this. Yes, the heavens unabashedly declare there is a creator. Yes, creation sings its maker's praise and reveals certain attributes of his. But when all is said and done, it can never draw the sinner to repentance. It can't do it. That's not its job. Nor can it ever cause the sinner to look upon the face of Christ and adore him for the glorious price that he paid on the cross of Calvary. Spurgeon puts it this way, that yet for all this, the clear declaration of God's glory by the heavens and their expanse, yet for all this, to what avail is the loudest declaration to a deaf man? or the clearest showing to one spiritually blind. God the Holy Ghost must illuminate us, or all the suns in the Milky Way never will. All that the creation can do for the sinner is condemn him or her for worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. It can never preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus. Creation can never and will never tell the sinner of how the second person, the triune God, came down from heaven and took on the likeness of sinful flesh and was yet without sin. I mean, even the people who were there that day looking at Christ being crucified could not understand what was going on. If it's not for the special revelation of God and his word, nobody knows. Creation can and never will speak of how this person, the Lord Jesus, lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father. It can never and will never tell of how Jesus bore the full fury and indignation of the Father's wrath for his people's sin on the cross, died and was buried and rose again on the third day. It can never and will never speak of how he is returning one day to judge the living and the dead. It can never and will never tell of how the sinner must repent and put their faith in this Jesus alone to receive the gift of eternal life. What is needed for the sinner is not just general revelation, but special revelation. What the sinner needs is this. It needs the word of God. And it is to that end that we'll pick up in verse 7 next week. Lord willing. Let us pray. Father, uh, we come. And we thank you for the, the glory, uh, the glorious uh, testimony of your creation. But God, it can only do one thing. Testify that you are there. It can never testify uh, to the truth of the gospel. For God, if you hadn't spoke the gospel... Nobody would ever know. If you hadn't given us the Bible, nobody would ever know. We need not only the witness of your work, but we need the witness of your word. And we ask that you would glorify yourself and that we would be those who would point to creation, but also point, most importantly, to the word of God and call sinners to repent. So, Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.